All right, well, we're very happy to have uh, Kevin Jang, who is somehow on his way, I think, from Santa Barbara to Utah, taking the long way, and he's stopping by in uh, Davis. So happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess uh, it's really nice to be visiting Davis uh, virtually. Um, and um, yeah, this is actually the first time I'm giving this talk, just put up the slides. Um, uh, for, uh, during the last several days. So uh, feel free to ask any questions. So I would really appreciate any feedback. So anything you want to ask, any, if anything is unclear, uh, just feel free to ask. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, talk about um, uh, mostly a, a very interesting connection between neural networks and field theories. Um, so I, I find this quite intriguing because, um, I mean, the uh, the familiar set of tools that um, we always use to study field theories um, turn out to be also useful for studying something very different, which are neural networks. Um, so maybe that could tell us something about something new about how neural networks work in the machine learning context. And um, on the other hand, maybe we can learn something new about field theory. So whenever we um, can make this connection between seemingly very different things, I feel like there could be a lot of cool cool stuff to learn. Uh, so this is something that I've been thinking about for a while. Um, so we just recently put out um, a paper uh, together with colleagues in Santa Barbara um, on um, uh, that we call structures of neural network effective theories. So my talk will be mostly centered around this paper. Um, so let, yeah, let's get started. I'll start with a high level summary of this uh, neural network field theory um, connection um, before delving into the details. And then um, I will talk about uh, the details of how to write down an EFT for deep neural networks, uh, and then um, introduce the main um, uh, novel contribution of our work, which is a diagrammatic approach for uh, performing calculations um, in this type of EFTs, which um, makes it a lot more efficient uh, to obtain uh, um, the uh, observables relevant for neural networks. Um, and then uh, I'll also talk about how this diagrammatic approach um, reveals some structures of these EFTs and how those relate to the notion of criticality in these theories. So let me start with a high level summary. Um, so let me start with the very basics, um, just to be sure that everyone is on the same page, um, everyone knows what uh, we're talking about. Uh, so what is a deep neural network? Uh, so basically uh, a neural network, I can think of it as um, a function approximator. So the goal, uh, at least in the context of supervised learning is that um, uh, we wanna learn a function uh, from some training data set. Uh, so perhaps the simplest illustration is something like this. We have some data set x, y, um, uh, a set of x, y points, and we want to uh, find a function that fits, uh, the, the, uh, fits these data points. And this is, we want the network to approximate such a function. Uh, and the function could be a lot more complicated than this simple example. Um, uh, you can see my um, pointer, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, so the task or the function we want to approximate could be something like uh, um, image rec uh, uh, in an image recognition task. The input would be an image, which is um, uh, basically three numbers RGB for each pixel. So that's a, a very high dimensional input space. And the output that we want the function to learn could be something like a uh, cat or dog. Uh, so we recognize what is in this image. <clears throat> and to achieve this, um, uh, I guess the modern development has been centered around um, uh, machine learning architectures um, known as deep neural networks. And there are uh, various architectures that people um, have been using. And this is perhaps the the archetype, the simplest structure um, of a deep neural network is known as the multi-layer perceptron. Uh, so basically we're just stacking uh, layers uh, of neurons on top of each other. And uh, these arrows represent the operations that we're performing on these neurons. Uh, so this is the input layer. On the right is the output layer. In the middle, we have hidden layers. There could be many hidden layers. There could be many neurons. 
uh, in every hidden layer. Uh, and the way to understand the, uh, these operations is that uh, let's associate a number um, with each neuron. These are called pre-activations um, in machine learning terminology. Uh, but um, I guess I don't need to really use that terminology. I'll just call them neuron or um, neuron fields because uh, these are functions of the input. Uh, so to get the first hidden layer neuron fields, what we do is we take the input X and multiply it by a matrix that, that is called the weight um, and add to it uh, um, something called a bias. So this is a linear transformation from the input layer to the, uh, to the first hidden layer. And then to go to the next hidden layer, we first apply uh, the sigma function, which is a nonlinear function called an activation function. Um, so this can be something like tank, or there are also other choices um, that are commonly used. Um, so this basically makes it possible that we can use the network to approximate a nonlinear function, because otherwise everything would just be linear algebra. Um, so after applying this nonlinear activation function, we just do the same. We just multiply by weights and then add to it a bias to get to the next layer and so on. We repeat this process until we get to the output layer. Um, so in this way, um, a deep neural network uh, would be calculating a function that is um, parameterized by these weights and biases. So these are the parameters that can be trained. Um, and the way we implement training is that we first randomly initialize these parameters uh, at the beginning, so at the initialization, um, following some probability distributions. Uh, and then we let these evolve using gradient descent. So basically we want to minimize a loss function, which, which could be uh, something like this. So basically calculate the uh, gradient of the loss with respect to each parameter, and then update the parameters uh, to go in the direction that makes the loss smaller. Uh, so that is one training step, and then we iterate the process until we find uh, the minimum of the training loss. Um, so that's how a neural network works, basically, at the very basic level. Um, and then how to make the connection to field theories. The idea is that instead of considering a single neural network, we consider an ensemble of networks. All of them are randomly initialized following the same uh, distributions for the weights and biases. Uh, and I already mentioned that um, for each neuron, we associate with it a scalar field phi of x. Um, and the, uh, what we're interested in would be the statistics of the ensemble. And that has the natural description in terms of an action. This is exactly the way we uh, study Euclidean field theory. The probability distribution is just exponential minus action. And then once we figure out what the action is, we know the ensemble statistics, we can calculate all kinds of correlators, observables. Um, so why this is uh, why is this useful or why is this uh, um, doable uh, or analytically tractable? Um, and the important point is that there is a very simple limit. Um, in the limit where the width of the network goes to infinity, so basically n is the number of neurons uh, in the hit, uh, in each hidden layer. If that goes to infinity, um, we actually have a free theory. Uh, so the the infinite width limit has been studied for a long time. It was first studied in uh, the 90s, and I guess in the machine learning literature, uh, this limit corresponds to Gaussian processes, and in the field theory language, these are free theories. Um, but of course, realistically, we don't have infinite, infinitely wide networks, uh, but in practical applications, we do have uh, fairly wide networks. Uh, by wide, uh, what this means precisely is that the width is much greater than the depth. Uh, then these are uh, these would actually map onto weakly interacting theories, and this is where we can use perturbation theory, Feynman diagrams, all these uh, uh, standard field theory tools uh, that that we're familiar with uh, to study these systems. Um, I guess another important or interesting aspect of this neural network field theory connection um, is um, uh, RG flow. So basically, um, I guess 
it has been known for a while that uh, there is this uh, connection between information flow through a neural network and RT flows uh, in, in physics. Um, so uh, the idea is the input is like the UV information, the microscopic information, and the output is uh, uh, the IR. And uh, I guess I guess some of you might have seen this kind of pictures showing how um, a convolutional neural network is doing uh, in terms of recognizing images. Uh, this is from I guess, some classic work um, uh, showing this point. Like in, uh, so there, there are many hidden layers. Um, in the first few hidden layers, the network will try to identify the low level features. Uh, so the input images are just numbers for each pixel. Uh, and then the network will first try to uh, figure out the low level features like edges and dark spots. And then um, at later um, uh, hidden layers, uh, process these into mid-level features like eyes, ears, nose. Uh, and then finally close to the output layer, uh, you recognize high level features like facial structures in order to identify a person, for example, at the output layer. So this is basically uh, the idea of going from microscopic details uh, to some microscopic um, information uh, at the output. So, um, so this has been, so this is a pretty heuristic argument. Um, and the idea is that uh, by uh, studying the connection to uh, effective theories or uh, of field, th field theories, effective field theories, um, we can make this connection a lot more precise. Um, and one interesting phenomenon is uh, that um, we actually generically have exponential scaling uh, in deep neural networks. And the reason is uh, we're basically multiplying a lot of matrices together when going from the input to the output. Uh, and that's why uh, uh, something like a neural network is, pretty, uh, is prone to exponential behavior. Uh, so that uh, corresponds to flowing to a trivial fixed point uh, in uh, effective field theories. Um, but that is not good for machine learning um, because uh, we would have something either blowing up or going to zero exponentially. And that corresponds to numerical instability or loss of information. Uh, so we would like to avoid, we would like to avoid that. And the way to avoid that is to tune the network to criticality. So there's a notion of criticality that has been studied more recently. Um, and the idea is that at criticality, um, instead of exponential behavior, we have parallel behavior. And that corresponds to a non-trivial fixed point in the field theory language. Um, so I think this line of research making connections between uh, neural networks and field theories um, uh, is quite exciting. Um, I guess there are uh, two aspects. One is, um, uh, can we understand better what a deep neural network is doing? Like for, I guess for a long time, uh, we have been saying that um, uh, deep learning is like a black box. It just, uh, I mean, it just works. They don't know how, how it works. Uh, but I guess recently uh, there has been a lot of effort uh, trying to open the black box to see what deep neural networks are really doing, what is happening uh, in deep learning, why uh, deep neural networks um, can uh, do so well to learn things uh, while they might fail in some other cases. Uh, so there is a large literature on this recently. I mean, some of them are by physicists and I think it's uh, uh, very, very interesting that um, uh, a lot of the tools uh, that we have been using to study theoretical physics, uh, either it's field theory or some other uh, statistical systems or complex systems, those can be applied to uh, understand deep learning. Uh, that, that's pretty cool. And uh, actually, uh, I should mention in particular, this excellent book by Robert y uh, Yaida and Hunning, uh, which came out a couple of years ago. And this is uh, where uh, which basically motivated us to get into this uh, this subject, and uh, uh, our work largely builds on uh, this very interesting book. Um, I mean, the arrow goes both ways. So we could hope to learn about 
um, deep learning from field theory, we might also learn about field theory from neural networks. Uh, so could this give us a new angle uh, to learn about field theories? Uh, are there, I guess it's perhaps not crazy to imagine that there could be ways to engineer neural networks to simulate field theories. That would also be a very exciting direction to explore. Um, so yeah, that's basically the high level summary um, for this uh, neural networks field theories connection. Um, so I guess from, from now on, I'm gonna get into more details of how everything works. Um, so, okay, uh, any questions at this point? Okay, so, uh, oops, sorry, let's move on. Um, so how do we write down an EFT of deep neural networks? Um, so to define, well, to initialize a deep neural network, uh, we need to specify a couple of things. Uh, so first of all, architecture hyperparameters. So these are basically like the depth of the network, namely the number of layers and the width, the number of neurons per layer, uh, the input layer, the output layer, and all the hidden layers. And we will uh, be interested in the uh, the regime where the hidden layer width um, are large, so we can make an, uh, an expansion in one over the hidden layer width. And recall that uh, the network is performing this uh, type of operations uh, going from one layer to the next, uh, applying a, a nonlinear activation function multiplied by weights and then add with the bias. Uh, so these are the network parameters, uh, W and B, um, and these are uh, initially drawn from Gaussian distributions um, uh, with mean zero and variances given by uh, CW and CB. So these are called initialization hyperparameters. Uh, so these are hyperparameters because they determine how the parameters are sampled from the distribution. Okay, so we will talk a lot about hyperparameters and what follows. So yeah, just uh, uh, keep note of uh, the notation CW and CB here, just how these parameters are initialized. And as I said, instead of the idea is that instead of considering uh, one deep neural network, we're, we're gonna consider an ensemble network. Um, and for each network in this ensemble, we're gonna draw the weights and biases from the same Gaussian distributions. Um, and then we're uh, going to uh, calculate the statistics of this ensemble at initialization. And that is what we want to map onto an effective field theory action uh, via this equation. So I'm going to start talking about the derivation of the field theory action on the next slide. Um, uh, so for now, let me just mention that um, uh, once we have the action, uh, we would be able to calculate the observables. Um, and the observables of interest are the neuron correlators. Uh, I mean, ju just as we calculate correlators in field theory, we can uh, calculate the neuron correlators in the same way uh, in the path integral. Uh, and these are interesting because um, uh, by looking at how these correlators change from layer to layer, notice that there is a, a superscript uh, denoting the layer where the neuron is at. Um, by studying how this evolves from layer to layer, uh, we can understand how information is flowing through the network. And that is um, the notion of RG flow that I mentioned in the introduction. Um, can I ask a question? Yep. Um, maybe you'll say more about this, but I'm, I'm having uh, trouble going between the very high level introduction and this thing right here. I mean, if if I'm using a neural network to solve some problem, then uh, the parameters of the neural networks are presumably something very special. You know, I've optimized them to solve whatever problem I'm solving, right? And here you are telling me about random what happens when I have a, a Gaussian distribution of those things. So so I, I'm just, it's not clear to me why this observable that you've defined here is useful if I'm interested in neural networks to solve some particular problem. 
Okay, good. Yeah. So uh, the uh, let me put it this way. Um, so for all I'm going to talk about in this talk, um, the connection between neural networks and field theories um, is made at initialization. And the reason is um, at initialization, uh, this is where it is most straightforward to write down the field theory action corresponding to the ensemble neural networks. Of course, you can also ask, how does this ensemble evolve during training, right? And you can imagine that during training, this ensemble will, I mean, the action will evolve from this initial action to some different action. There could be a final action after training that will tell us what a fully trained network is doing. So for now, we're not there yet. Um, because that requires introducing a lot more um, technical details. Uh, so the most straightforward connection we can make is uh, we can make is at the initialization stage. Uh, so that said, so how to understand that um, uh, even at initialization, um, the behaviors of neuron correlators already tell us something about information propagation in deep neural networks. Right. Um, so there are several aspects of it. Um, I guess I won't be able to talk about the full details of everything, but I can talk about the rough idea. Uh, one aspect is that um, uh, these correlators at initialization uh, uh, would provide us the initial conditions for solving the training dynamics. In the end, uh, we can uh, write down the solution to the training process uh, in terms of the initial uh, conditions, right? Just as uh, when you're solving a classical mechanics problem, um, the position of some particle at time t is determined by the position of that particle at time zero and its velocity at time zero, right? So these are basically the positions at time zero. And to understand the dynamics, uh, of training, we have to introduce further structures into this theory. So these are called neural tangent kernels, which I'm not going to get into, but this has been worked out by other people. Uh, so the idea is that this provides a subset of the initial data, and we need more structures on top of it in order to understand trained networks. Can those be mapped onto field theory um, concepts? Um, I'm not sure yet. Um, where we haven't um, figured out that part. But uh, uh, so at the initialization stage, uh, this uh, connection to field theory is uh, the most transparent. And from the deep learning point of view, uh, this already uh, contains some of the information we need in order to understand uh, the training dynamics. So that, that is, I guess, what I can say from, um, from a high level. Yeah, so I think, I guess, okay, I think I get it. I think it's sort of like, uh, you can imagine that these correlators are sort of the response functions to perturbative training. Like, let's say you're just changing one node or a few nodes at a time relative to this initial thing. This is kind of telling you the response of the system to those kind of small changes in the initial uh, programming. Can I think of it in that way? Uh, or... I'm not totally sure. I mean, the response might, you might have to introduce additional uh, operators or additional uh, degrees of freedom to capture that. I haven't thought about it in that way, but uh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Okay, all right, thanks, but that's helpful. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I should have been clear on this. So we are establishing this connection between the neural network ensemble and EFT actions at initialization, that's where things are uh, uh, are most straightforward to write down. And yeah, if we want to consider training, which we can, uh, there are a lot of additional structures, which I'm not going to talk about. Okay, then let's derive the EFT action. Um, so the EFT action, um, uh, exponential minus action is equal to the probability distribution of all the neurons, and we can write uh, this um, joint probability distribution as a product of um, 
conditional probability distribution. So basically the distribution of the first layer neurons and then condition on that, what is the probability distribution of second layer neurons and so on. Uh, so we just need to figure out how to write down the conditional probability from the L minus one layer to the L layer. Um, and that's pretty simple because uh, the, uh, the rule for um, determining the values of the L layer neurons from the L minus one layer neurons is deterministic, uh, which means it's a delta function. It's a, it's a product of delta functions, one for each neuron and at each data point. Um, and then we convolute this with the, uh, uh, the probability distributions of the weights and biases. Well, the, yeah, the probabilities that we sample these weights and bias uh, parameters from. Uh, so these, as I said, um, will be set to Gaussian with um, variances determined by CW and CB. These are the hyperparameters. And then we can write the delta function as um, an integral over some auxiliary parameters lambda. And it also uh, becomes um, an argument of the exponential. And then once we have done that, uh, we can easily integrate out the weights and biases from this uh, integral um, because it's, uh, it's just Gaussian. Uh, and then once we have done that, we can integrate out also the auxiliary parameters lambda. And again, the integral is Gaussian. So everything is pretty easy analytically. In the end, we get something like this. So this looks like, um, again, it looks like a Gaussian. Um, well, it is a Gaussian with respect to phi L, the L layer field. Uh, but the important thing is that um, um, this quantity that appears in the middle, uh, that we call GL, uh, this is not a constant. This is uh, an operator built from the L minus one layer field. And the expression is uh, um, a sum over the previous layer neurons. Uh, and for each neuron, there is this operator where sigma uh, is the activation function. So I'm abbreviating the sigma acting on the neuron as just sigma like, subscript uh, neuron index and the uh, um, input index. So this is an operator. So what this is telling us is that this is an interaction uh, between the alpha layer neurons and L minus one layer neurons. Uh, there's also the prefactor. Um, so but I guess at this point, uh, it, this might start to look pretty familiar to you. Uh, I mean, th isn't this just uh, what we do in the body popo procedure? Um, and this delta function uh, is analogous to gauge fixing. Um, we're kind of picking a gauge, but here is there's no notion of uh, a gauge redundancy, but uh, uh, but the mathematics is the same. Um, and so I guess instead of uh, considering a family of gauges, um, here we're considering some physical distribution of the weights and biases. Uh, but in the end, we get something that looks pretty similar. And uh, to complete the analogy, uh, we can write the prefactor, this functional determinant, as a ghost action. So this is actually uh, an EFT that has both neurons and ghosts. Um, and then we can multiply these um, conditional probabilities together uh, to get the total action, um, which is just the sum over the layers. Um, and at each layer, we have a neuron action, which uh, we just saw on the previous slide, and a ghost action as well coming from the functional determinant. Uh, and it, it is the same operator, GL, that appears in both terms. Um, so from here, it should be clear that the structure of the interactions is the following. So here I'm writing down the neurons and ghosts at um, several layers. Then if we look at the L layer, the neurons will couple to the L minus one layer neurons via the neuron action as zero. Um, and the ghosts will couple also to these L minus one layer neurons via the ghost action as psi. Uh, and it's the same for the next layer and so on. Uh, so this structure actually is consistent with the simple fact that the network has directionality. Uh, so importantly, if we consider um, the loop corrections um, to the L minus plus layer neurons uh, coming from the L layer neurons and ghosts, they would cancel. 
just because the coupling of these neurons and ghosts to the L minus one layer neurons is the same uh, through this operator, but the sign is opposite. So these will always cancel and these will always cancel. Uh, so this is uh, um, just a very roundabout way of saying that uh, uh, the network is performing operations like from, uh, from left to right. So it cannot uh, use information from deeper layers to correct what is in the previous layers. Um, and this also implies uh, that when we are calculating the neuron correlators, uh, we actually don't need to consider ghosts. Uh, so if we consider, uh, if we calculate correlators of phi L, uh, then uh, although it, it, it couples to the ghosts at the deeper layers, uh, the, those will cancel against the neurons at the deeper layers. So we never have to um, consider ghosts when we are calculating these correlation functions. Um, although ghosts um, would enter in some other calculations, um, if uh, I guess I, I won't really get into that in this talk, but uh, it, it's just, I'm just saying that if we calculate this type of observables, uh, ghosts do not enter. We don't have to, have to worry about ghosts, although ghosts are useful to retain in other calculations. Can I ask a question? What, mm -hmm. is, there, is there a reason? What is the reason you seem to be restricting to correlation functions of the nodes at the same layer? Is there a reason for that? Or do you not mean it or what? All the uh, yeah, so I think you, you can consider also uh, correlation functions between neurons at different layers. Uh, we didn't calculate those. I guess the motivation for considering uh, the same layer uh, neuron correlators is that uh, by studying th their dependence on the layer, uh, we get some information about uh, what the network is doing from layer to layer, like how information is being processed. Uh, so that's why these are a useful set of observables to consider. Okay. Uh, so I guess correlators between neurons at different layers, these could also be interesting for answering some other questions that we haven't thought about. Uh, but yeah, I guess you could also calculate those. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, so you say this loop will cancel. Uh, is this a result of the initial Gaussian distribution or it will always cancel no matter what the initial distribution is? Uh, um, Yeah, how, how much does it depend on the uh, initialization distribution? Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, so, I mean, very naively, I would guess um, that you still have some sort of cancellation just because uh, the network has directionality. You're always calculating uh, the next layer stuff from the previous layer stuff, um, but they might not be manifest in the same way. Uh, so if it's not a Gaussian distribution, then the actions will look different. And yeah, I'm not exactly sure um, what the, the things will look like. Uh, yeah, so that's an interesting question. I mean, for a given set of weights, you have causal propagation, right? If you knew the yep. weights and the biases, you could just calculate everything. The reason you have a field theory is because you're performing some kind of uh, ensemble average over those, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, describes an ensemble. Yeah, so so it seems like there should be some sort of forward propagation yeah. structure, no matter what, I would guess, also whatever distribution you assume. Yeah, right, yeah. Can I, can I also, is it related to that? Is it, is so I would guess that the Gaussian is, the one that allows you to make the closest connection to field theory um, is is there is it thought that somehow the Gaussian uh, initialization is optimal for practical applications? Is is there any sense of of that? Uh, so that okay, I I'm not totally sure. Uh, the one thing is uh, uh, Gaussian distribution is pretty commonly used in practice, I guess. Um, there have been 
claims. I think I, I've seen um, claims that um, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's non Gaussian. Uh, like it's still the, uh, it's only the mean and the variance um, that matter. Uh, but uh, I'm not totally convinced by that, and I haven't thought about it very carefully. <laughs> so yeah, it's not clear to me how the like the higher moments of the initial distribution would change the story. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right. So oh yeah, that's the 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 end of the second part. Uh, we have the EFD action, and now um, we want to calculate this action. Um, so in order to do that in an efficient way, I'm going to introduce a diagrammatic approach. Uh, so let's derive the Feynman rule. Um, so this is the action that we just derived. Um, the alpha layer neurons coupled to the L minus one layer neurons via this operator. Um, so the way to derive the Feynman rules is let's first imagine that the L minus one layer neurons were classical background fields. Then in this case, we really have, do have a free theory um, for the L layer neurons. Uh, so the two point function um, is just this operator GL and the four point. Um, the four point correlator um, has three terms. Uh, these are just different weak contractions. I can contract I1, I2, I3, and I4. Each of them will give us the propagator GL and our three terms uh, from permutations. Uh, this is all very simple, uh, but of course in reality, the L minus one layer neurons have statistical fluctuations. Um, but that's also simple to incorporate because we just put expectation values um, around these factors of GLs. And we can also represent these um, diagrammatically. Uh, so just imagine two neurons coupling to uh, this G operator, and then we pull up, put a blob here, meaning that we take the expectation value. And similarly for the four point correlator, uh, it just, uh, we have two of these uh, vertices and we have a blob connecting the two factors of Gs. And this is uh, just the expectation value here. Uh, and we can um, do the same thing for all the higher point correlators. So in the end, uh, Effectively, we can simply use this Feynman rule to build up the diagrams. So two neurons coupled to this composite operator that we denote by double wavy lines. And we just need to be sure to attach uh, every wavy line to a blob. Uh, in other words, they cannot be external lines because we have to type their expectation values in this statistical ensemble. Uh, we can further decompose this basic final rule into a web piece and a fluctuation piece. Um, so the fluctuation piece we call delta. Uh, and from the definition, it's clear that this delta is just uh, the product of two activation functions minus this expectation value. Uh, so this is a useful decomposition because oftentimes we're interested in connected correlators. So we are we're only going to draw connected diagrams. Uh, and the web piece is automatically disconnected from the rest of the diagram. Uh, so it's only the delta, the fluctuating piece that enters connected uh, correlators and we'll use a single wavy line to denote a delta. Can I, can I ask to see if I'm understanding? So the fact that you have uh, only vertices that connect two phi's rather than additional phi's is, is that because you have a Gaussian correlator, you're assuming Gaussian distributions that are completely characterized by the two-point function? So if I wanted to include some perturbative non-Gaussianity, I might get vertices with more phi. Is that correct? So, no. By Gaussian, you mean the, uh, yeah, I guess uh, you're referring to the fact that um, the action is a sum over terms where each term is uh, a, a phi by linear coupling to something. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So it is this uh, special structure of the EFT action that allows us to um, use this simple final rule, yeah. So the fact that the, the weights are Gaussian distributed gives only non-trivial two-point correlators, well, 
Okay. No, no. So the higher point correlators will be there um, because uh, yeah. this is not a free theory. Um, I mean, that's why we put a, put a blob here. So we'll get to that in a moment. Okay. Um, All right, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah. Thanks. So now we have the Feynman rule. Now um, it becomes clear uh, why this is a one over n expansion. So each interaction vertex between two neurons and the delta operator comes with a factor of one over n where n is the hidden layer width. Um, so in the limit where n goes to infinity, we have no interaction. So this is a free theory. Uh, and for finitely wide networks, uh, n large but finite, uh, which is the case that's most relevant in practice, uh, we will have a weakly interacting theory where all the interactions are proportional to powers of one over n. And that is what allows us to uh, perform a, perform perturbative calculations. So all the observables can be calculated order by order in one over n. Uh, and we're going to be interested in the connected correlators and their RG flows. Um, so yeah, basically a general result is that um, uh, a two K point connected correlator scales as n to the Y minus K. So the two point correlator is order one, four point is order one over n, uh, six point is one over n squared and so on. So there, there is a hierarchical structure um, of the uh, size of the coupling or the connected correlators. So yeah, let's start with a two point correlator. Um, actually already showed how to calculate it. It's just, it just comes from the basic Feynman rule. Um, just pull a blob here. It's the expectation value of this GL operator. Um, and um, we can make an expansion in one over n um, called the coefficients k, p, where p is uh, zero, one, two, et cetera. The leading order two-point correlator is k zero. Um, and to calculate it, we simply use um, the free theory or the, yeah, the, the n going to zero, oh, sorry, n going to infinity limit uh, for the previous layer um, to calculate the blob. So this is a, just an operator. Um, of the L minus one layer neurons. Um, and we need to calculate the expectation value of it. We calculate it in the free theory, meaning that we use free propagators K zero at L minus one layer to calculate this. Um, and just plug in the definition of this operator, this is the result. Um, so this is uh, a recursion relation that allows us to determine K zero at the alpha layer from K zero at the L minus one layer. Uh, this is uh, 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 known as the kernel recursion uh, in the machine learning literature. K is known as K zero is known as the kernel. Um, we can also think of it as an RG flow of K zero uh, with the UV boundary condition determined by uh, the first hidden layer um, kernel. Uh, so we can further calculate this expectation value once we specify the activation function sigma, but for now we're just going to stay agnostic about the activation function. So the result will apply it to any activation function. Uh, we can move on to higher point correlators. Uh, let's look at the connected four point correlator. Um, so here we're going to look at diagrams like this. So four uh, neurons at the alpha layer. Uh, Two of them would couple to a delta, um, and the other two a couple to another delta. Uh, these are single wavy lines, and then the delta is attached to a blob. Um, so, in order to calculate this, uh, and I should mention that uh, uh, there, there are three terms related by permutations of the neuron indices, and this is one of them, where one and two are connected, three and four are connected. Um, so. Uh, to calculate this, um, noted that there, there is a sum over neuron indices for the internal uh, delta insertions. Um, so there are two cases to consider. Either J1 and J2 are the same index or they're different. If they are the same, uh, then we can basically use a free theory um, uh, to calculate the blob in the middle. And we can easily write down the expression, which is the correlator of two factors of deltas uh, calculated in the free theory with propagator K0 at the previous layer. And overall, this is uh, scaling as one over N. And the reason is each 
vertex is one over n, and then we have a sum over neurons that's a factor of n in the numerator. So overall, it's one over n. Uh, the second contribution is where we have different neuron indices on the two sides. And then we cannot use free theory propagators to connect the two uh, because the free theory um, is flavor preserving. Uh, you cannot propagate from one neuron to a different one. Um, so the leading contribution would be if we insert uh, a connected four point correlator of the L minus one layer represented by this smaller blob. Um, so in this way, we can write down the expression, which I will explain in a moment. Uh, but for now, um, two things. Uh, one is that this um, is a recursion relation for the connected four-point correlator in that uh, it allows us to determine the L layer connected four-point correlator from the L minus one layer connected four-point correlator. And of course, also the L minus one layer two-point correlator. Uh, and the second thing is that this second diagram also scales as one over n. Uh, compared to the first one, uh, we have one more sum of the neural indices. So that's a, a, another factor of n in the numerator. Uh, but then we also have a factor of one over n coming from this uh, uh, vertex insertion. So consistently, each uh, connected four point correlator will scale as one over n. Okay, so now let me try to explain the expression corresponding to the second diagram in a bit more detail, just so that you know how this uh, um, uh, how these Feynman rules are being used in in practice. Uh, so these two factors in the end are easy to understand. These are just the blobs. Um, these are correlators between delta and two factors of phi, uh, and then. This factor is also easy to understand. It comes from the insertion of the uh, connected four-point correlator of the L minus one layer. So uh, the remaining factors. Uh, so this one over four, this is a symmetry factor uh, because exchanging these two neuron propagators will give the same diagram. Exchanging these two would also give the same diagram. So there's a factor of one over, um, so one half times one half from the symmetry factor. So it's just standard from uh, the way we would normally use Feynman rules. Um, and finally, these factors, these are inverse propagators. So why are they here? Um, so the, uh, the thing is when calculating uh, a blob like this, which correspond to the um, correlator here, uh, this would include the propagators that go into this blob. And the same is true for this smaller blob for the connected four-point correlator, V4, this factor here. So this V4 would also include these propagators going into it. So we're actually double counting every internal uh, propagator. So that's why uh, for each internal propagator in this type of diagrams, we have to write an inverse propagator just to make sure we don't double count. So this is the first line um, of the equation. It can be written more compactly um, as the expression on the second line uh, by using weak contractions. Uh, so the, the idea is that we're contracting uh, each of these phi's with the phi's that are contained in this delta operator that amounts to taking functional derivatives. Uh, and by this weak contraction, we get factors of the propagator, which cancel the inverse propagators. So it can be written more easily in this form. Um, so this result, um, the RG flow or the recursion for the connected four-point correlator, um, it was worked out previously. And uh, we just found um, the diagrams give us um, an easy way to, to reproduce all of these results. Uh, so I guess what makes the diagrammatic method really powerful is that uh, it's really easy to go to higher orders. Um, so I guess to go to higher orders, there is some additional uh, technical detail I need to, uh, I need to introduce. Uh, the basic building blocks are actually uh, something we call star blobs, which uh, are defined by uh, just a regular blob, a, a correlator minus uh, some of the contributions from uh, WIC contracting um, the, the, phi, the phi fields going into it. Uh, so 
I guess without going into details, um, this basically takes care of a lot of uh, uh, the disconnected diagrams. So in the end, we want to calculate connected correlators. So we want to subtract all disconnected diagrams that takes care of a lot of that. And it also uh, takes care of, uh, uh, like there, there are certain contributions that would otherwise be double counted, but by implementing this subtraction, we take care of that as well. So that all of these are details, which I'm not going into, but in the end, um, there is a very simple expression associated with each star blob, which can be written as a functional derivative of the product of deltas. Uh, and we can calculate, yep. Sorry, can I, can I ask a quick question? So, sorry, I could have asked this at any time really, but it just occurred to me. So uh, how many, I'm trying to understand how many uh, parameters this theory has. So, it seems like uh, you 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 would need to specify some kind of width or at least or widths to just to say what the, the the what the Gaussian distributions are, right? Like how wide is the distribution for Wij? Uh, actually, is it what what exactly ensemble what exact ensemble of matrices is it? You know, are they symmetric matrices? What are they, right? So. There seems yeah. like there's, in principle, a large number of parameters in there. Does so, okay, let, yeah, let me uh, first be sure I understand what you're asking. So uh, there, there's a difference between the parameters of the neural network and the parameters of the EFT. Yeah, I'm talking about right. the EFT, the ensemble. The EFT, right. So for the EFT, uh, the, the EFT parameters are the neural network hyperparameters, right? So um, in that sense, what we have are um, just the, the width of all the layers. These are the parameters of the EFT. And as we have seen, uh, all the interactions are one over N, or N takes one of these values depending on which layer we are at. And also CW and CB, which enter the definition of those delta operators. Uh, so. I mean, these could be different for each layer. Uh, so these are all the parameters we have that determine all the couplings in yeah. the EFT. So, but so so W is a matrix, right? Right. So yeah. So yeah. What every... what on? I mean, for for a given L, what kind of an ensemble is it? Are you assuming it's a symmetric matrix? So every Wij, every component of this matrix is independent. Okay. So they're all independently drawn from Gaussian distributions with these with this variance. And so you just assume that every entry has the same variance for yeah. both W and B. Yeah. It's allowed to depend on the layer. Okay. Right. So you did say that. Okay. I guess I, I just. Yeah. Missed. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's yeah. fine. I thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? So. Sure. I, I want to clarify. So the different x1, x2, this position actually result, uh, actually represent one neural network inside the ensemble, right? Can you say it again? I'm sorry. So each x1, x2, this position vector represent uh -huh. one of the neural network inside the ensemble. So the x1 and x2 are the input to the neural network. Um, oh, okay. So basically in the field theory, uh, on the field theory side, these are just uh, the normal space-time argument um, of the fields. So each field phi uh, is, takes value at a point x in input space. Okay. And is there a index? I mean, which index run from zero to the number of examples n? Like uh, the number of the ensemble, the, like we know, is there any index here representing how many how many networks inside the ensemble or? How many networks are in the ensemble? No, because uh, uh, I mean, effectively that is infinity, right? It's, it's uh, ensemble, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, well, it is, uh, yeah, well, I, I guess, yeah, it's just, a, probability distribution over the ensemble that we're calculating, uh, like thinking of it as uh, uh, many, many networks 
uh, is just a useful way to think about it. It's like uh, in, in, in StatMac, uh, when you can think of uh, like canonical ensemble, for example, you can physically think of uh, doing some Monte Carlo simulation on your computer, initialize 10,000 systems, and that's the size of the ensemble. But actually, it's just the means of approximating the like the ensemble properties. But those can be calculated. Um, many of those can be calculated analytically without referring to how many ensembles are in your simulation. Okay, got it. Okay, so yeah, I was about to show uh, very quickly uh, a few examples of carrying out this calculation to higher orders. So um, I talked about the two-point correlator and leading order. We can also push the calculation to the next leading order pretty easily. Uh, this is a K1 term in this Taylor expansion. Uh, they're, they're just two diagrams. Uh, because this is order one over N, we would either have to insert an NLO propagator from the previous layer, or we have to insert a four-point connected correlator at the previous layer. So there are just these two possibilities. And the expressions are very simple to write down. I mean, the same result was derived in this book by Robert Zeta and Hunning, uh, but basically, I mean, just to, we can use two diagrams to reproduce what they worked out after several pages. Uh, and we can also derive some new results um, that um, have not appeared in the uh, previous literature. Um, so we can calculate the connected six point correlator, which is also, Pretty easy, there are only four diagrams uh, and also eight point correlator. Uh, there are a few more diagrams, uh, but again, um, the, the, the value, the expression corresponding to each diagram is uh, uh, pretty straightforward to write down. So this is just showing you, uh, like this is a, a pretty efficient systematic framework that we can push um, to, to high order calculations. Uh, so I guess at the end, uh, oh, um, how much time do I have? <laughs> um, zero. <laughs> zero. Okay. So, well, we, how much time do you need? Let's uh, yeah, let's let's take an oh, hour or something. Yeah, sorry. I, I guess I can go over this last part fairly quickly, and just to uh, yeah, because I, I did mention uh, the notion of RG flow and criticality at the beginning, just to get back to it and tell you a little bit about how the diagrammatic framework uh, gives us some better understanding of what is going on. So very quickly. Yeah, why don't we do this? Why don't you just spend about five minutes on that and then we'll yeah, sounds good. normally stop and we'll stick around. And if there, if you need a little more time, we could maybe talk about that, but. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I Thanks. guess five minutes will be enough. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so as I said at the beginning, exponential behavior is generic because we are multiplying uh, together a bunch of matrices, uh, but that is not good. Uh, we wanna fine tune the network hyperparameters to their critical values, so we don't have exponential uh, behavior. And, and the way to analyze this is, suppose we take a variation of uh, the two-point correlator um, at the L minus one layer and ask how does the L layer two-point correlator change? That can be calculated diagrammatically by this type of diagram. Uh, delta, the variation of the alpha layer two-point correlator can be determined from the variation of the L minus one layer two-point correlator. Um, and this, uh, uh, the, the result is written in terms of this uh, uh, susceptibility. So basically how uh, the alpha layer quantity would respond to a change of the L minus one layer quantity. And it has this very simple expression and very roughly speaking, we want the susceptibility to be unity because if it's either greater or smaller than unity, then it will either exponentially explode or exponentially approach some, uh, some fixed point of the RG flow. But it's only when we tune the network to criticality, uh, meaning the chi, the susceptibility is unity uh, in the sense that it is a symmetrized product of delta functions. Uh, that we have power law scaling instead of uh, exponential scaling. And we can also calculate the, the critical exponent, how it is approaching uh, the fixed point. 
Um, so what does what does this mean for the tuning of the network? So uh, we're really tuning the hyperparameters of the network. So this is a plot that I took from uh, one of the earliest papers that studied the uh, uh, criticality in deep neural networks. Uh, so it's in a slightly different context, but uh, um, uh, nevertheless, I find it very cool to to show. So this is basically a fi a, a phase diagram. Uh, for neural networks with activation function uh, of tench. Um, so you can also do the analysis for different activation functions and talk about different universality classes, how the scaling behavior is different between them. That's all very interesting stuff that you can find in this book if you're interested. Uh, but for this particular case, this is uh, the hyperparameter space of CW and CB in our notation. Uh, there is an ordered phase, a chaotic phase, where uh, there is an exponential behavior either going to zero or going to infinity for one of the components of the susceptibility. And there is a phase boundary between them. And at the end of this phase boundary is the critical point uh, where uh, this criticality condition is satisfied. And this is where we want the neural network to be at. We want to set CWCB to be at this point so that we can remove the exponential scaling. Uh, so all of these analyses from the previous literature um, pretty much focused on uh, two-point correlators. Um, and the, the criticality condition was derived for, uh, for two-point correlators. And it was an open question, um, what happens for higher point connected correlators? Uh, because uh, we want not only two-point correlators, but actually all of the higher point correlators to scale in a nice way. Uh, they should not exponentially explode or vanish. Otherwise, the network will still exhibit some kind of uh, undesirable features. Um, so uh, naively, this would uh, seem like uh, imposing more constraints than tunable hyperparameters. Because if we have already set our hyperparameters uh, to make sure the two-point correlators are well behaved, uh, we don't have any additional degrees of freedom to tune. Uh, so why can we still uh, make the network well behaved and, uh, regarding higher point connected correlators? Um, and the reason turns out to be that uh, these higher point connected correlators have a common structure. Uh, so we can do the same diagrammatic calculation for the four point correlator. And it's basically um, two of the diagrams um, from a two point correlator calculation. We just glue them together the same structure on both sides of this diagram. Uh, and again, we get the same susceptibility factor uh, we introduce for the two-point analysis. And it's the same for higher point correlators. Uh, and generally for arbitrary high point correlators, it's uh, always going to be a symmetrized product of um, susceptibility factors. So this actually implies that uh, there is a single criticality condition uh, which we have derived from the two-point analysis. And uh, once that is satisfied, we actually ensure power law scaling for all connected correlators. So this is what we discovered uh, uh, very nicely from this diagrammatic approach um, that, I mean, this is something that confused me for a while, but uh, in the end, we figured it's really because of the structures of how uh, the RG can be calculated from diagrams that makes it really transparent. Uh, so yeah, I've used up my five minutes, I guess. So <laughs> let me uh, just conclude by saying that I, I think it's a, a really interesting direction to, to explore the connection between neural networks and field theories. Um, and uh, yeah, we have um, proposed a diagrammatic approach uh, and uh, that uh, helps reveal some of the structures of the RG calculations that underlie the successful tuning to criticality of these uh, deep neural networks. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take more questions. Any other question? Where are you now? Where am I now? Yeah. I, I, I'm still in Santa Barbara. This is okay. uh, my KITP office. Uh, hi, I'm uh, the Xinjiang. Uh, uh, can you go? Hi, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm outside the. Uh, <laughs>
Then I go back to the space diagram in the physicality. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, uh, the order and the chaotic means what you have exponential growing and the decaying things. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess to be more precise, um, uh, this is uh, showing um, the phase diagram um, for one of the components of the susceptibility. So by that, I mean uh, the susceptibility um, defined yeah, in this way, it has four arguments, x1, x2, y1, y2, right? So uh, it's a tensor in the input space. So it has different components. Uh, and I believe what they looked at is one of the components that characterize uh, the, dis the distance between two inputs. Uh, so you would ask whether the distance would grow exponentially or will the two inputs will uh, converge to the same output so that corresponds to the chaotic and ordered phases respectively. Um, and the boundaries where the distance between the two inputs would just stay constant or that that they uh, it scales in a power law manner. Uh, but of course, there are other components of this tensor, and in the end, it's only at this point where we have criticality. And also, that's a critical point. You need the CD to be zero. That means the, the B prime should be zero. Right. Yeah. Right. So the bias should be zero at initialization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that means it doesn't evolve. Oh, it doesn't mean it doesn't evolve uh, during training. It will still evolve during training. This is just initialization to make sure that um, uh, there's no exponential behavior for uh, a network at initialization. So the, is, is the interpretation of criticality that if I have a nice critical system, that's my initial thing, then it's going to be somehow more efficiently trained. Because exactly, yeah. if, I, if I make a change to try and start fitting my data, my training data, then that's going to propagate through the network in a nice way. It's not going to chaotically change the output or yeah. it's not going to, the, in, the changes that I make in one layer don't get completely damped out. It's yeah. a nice, uh, it's sort of between those two cases. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I guess in the um, in the context of training, uh, people talk about the exploding and vanishing gradient problem. Um, so basically, uh, generically, uh, I mean, if you go deeper in the network, then it's really hard to train the parameters because uh, it will be exponentially suppressed or exponentially explode. Uh, but this is uh, like a uh, a manifestation of the same problem, uh, but for networks at initialization. So basically, uh, at initialization, you want the network to be able to propagate through, or you want the information to be able to propagate through the network. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it will be very hard to train a network. So I would guess you would want to have, uh, there's some critical exponent that tells you what the power is, and you would want that, uh, to be such that the fall off is as uh, gentle as possible, right? So you get something like, right? So in, in this language, I don't, I don't know what your sign convention is, but you want that to be either uh, small or large, right? You want, you want it to be such that the correlations fall off they don't grow, I'm guessing, or do they grow? I mean, actually, actually- Yeah, so good. So that's a secondary question. Uh, the most important thing is to make sure that uh, we don't have exponential scaling. And sure. As long as it's power law instead of exponential, uh, generally it's fine. Uh, we don't have loss of information or uh, instability. Uh, and of course, you can further ask, um, can we have more favorable power law scaling. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah, that's what I'm going to ask. Like in a, yeah. in, in a quantum field theory, these critical exponents depend just on universality class generally, yeah. right? Right. They're sort right. of constants of nature, but here it's not so obvious. I mean, because 
in quantum field theory, that's because you're requiring locality. There's all sorts of constraints that you're requiring. Here, it's just you did the calculation for one case where you could do the calculation, but you could imagine maybe there are other, you change the probability distribution, you allow higher moments. Yeah, I mean, all of those, uh, I don't think um, have been studied. Um, even for, um, well, I guess at least for the um, case where we have Gaussian initialization for the uh, weights and biases, uh, there are um, different universality classes that have been discussed, uh, like tank falls into one of the universality classes. Oh, there, there is another prominent one uh, that have different uh, critical exponents. Uh, so, and yeah, so there is also the notion of universality class and um, like that's determined by the activation function. Uh, but of course that's assuming that we initialize our ensemble in this way. And if you change the initialization, we could have something different, but I don't think that has been studied in any detail. But, you're, but the activation function is in some sense an infinite number of parameters already. <laughs> and um, it's a smooth function, right? It's a smooth function. And it doesn't have to be smooth. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. uh, but um, um, I guess it's not as bad as that uh, because uh, large classes of activation functions uh, will have uh, the, same, the same behavior. Uh, so right. perhaps uh, can try to explain a little bit more here. Uh, so Tank uh, is in one of the universality classes uh, called K star equal to zero universality class. So basically the fixed point is at K star equal to zero and you just have power law scaling approaching this fixed point. Uh, and this universality class actually includes um, a lot of activation functions. Uh, as long as an activation function passes through zero and it has a positive first derivative, then it will fall into that universality class. Yeah. And if it is smooth. And the idea is that the fixed point is at zero. So it's only the vicinity of zero that matters. So that's the first derivative. Um, of the, of the activation function at zero. So that's why uh, like all of these uh, different functions with different second, third, higher derivatives, they will still fall into the same universality class. So in, in, in some ways, this naively looks like the opposite of field theory in the sense that, you know, in each layer, you're really assuming that everything is connected to everything else with an equal probability. So there's no notion of locality, right? right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet, somehow, this seems to rhyme with the results seem to rhyme with <laughs> things that we're used to in field theory. I, I don't know. I don't know what the question is, but do you have any comments or thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. I mean, uh, uh, so this is a very, uh, I would say, um, non-canonical or non-standard type of, or unfamiliar type of field theories. Exactly as you said, there is no obvious notion of locality um, just because everything is connected uh, to everything. So uh, even when I was talking about RG, I guess uh, the, the caution is that this is not like from, uh, there's no energy scale associated with it. It's really just an analogy. It's not to be taken too literally, um, but there are, there are other things we can uh, um, we can study, like uh, people have looked into how symmetry, uh, either internal or space-time symmetries, would manifest in this connection. Uh, so that is a meaningful set of questions to ask. Um, locality is more difficult, and I don't think uh, there has been um, really any discussion about it. 
I think Jim Halverson and collaborators have been trying to work on it, but uh, I don't think they've worked it out. But they ha had some very interesting discussions about symmetry. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know anything about neural networks, but if I, if I really was hyped up about the RG analogy, you know, I might try to try to say something like, okay, my input is extremely high dimensional. My output is super low dimensional, right? It might be just a yes or no answer. So maybe I should think about it like coarse graining somehow. I start with very large amount of information. Yeah. And so maybe I should be trying to think about the, the ends, right? The number of nodes in each layer as sort of slowly decreasing. Is that is that a thing? I mean, is that something that people try to do in neural networks? Uh, try to um, somehow that, force the yeah. network to boil things down in a, you know, is that? Uh, I guess it depends on the details of how you do it, like naively just uh, shrinking the network width um, would not work. Um, because, uh, uh, so yeah, here's a way to, to understand it. Uh, recall I was talking about the four point connected correlator and it scales as one over N. Um, and the four point connected correlator, uh, the physical meaning of it is really the fluctuations of the two point correlators. Um, so if N is made smaller and smaller, the four point connected correlator will grow. That means we have more and more fluctuations. Mm -hmm. That is something we don't want. So in a sense, um, the fact that uh, we have a wide network um, is really um, uh, is important in that it, it suppresses uh, fluctuations. Um, so basically, um, we are interested in not only how a network would behave on average, but also if you initialize two different networks, how different would they be? Like what is the uncertainty in your final prediction? You want to have control over that. Uh, so that's why uh, I guess making, naively making the layers more and more, um, more and more narrow, uh, I don't think it will work. Although I guess there are other tricks you can play, uh, but that's, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, beyond uh, what I know about. But eventually you end up with just say one node if they're the right. So are you saying- that oh, No, it's only the hidden layer. They right. have whatever, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, and then one. The last thing is yes or no, cat or dog. And that just yeah. distills a huge amount of information in one right. step yeah. down to so a yes or no All question. I was talking about are the hidden layer width yeah, uh, should be large. Uh, so I was just saying naively, reducing the hidden layer width would not work um, unless you play some tricks. So the output, of course, there are only order one nodes. It could be one or could be a few, but not many. That's okay. But it's about the hidden layer width. But somehow that doesn't cause problems. Going from a thousand down to one or two doesn't cause problems, but you're saying it's gradually decreasing it would cause a problem. Yeah, so, uh, okay, here's maybe an intuitive way to, to see this. Um, just look at um, the uh, how we compute um, uh, a neuron from the previous layer neurons. We're adding up all the previous layer neurons with some um, random weights uh, or trained weights, right? So the more neurons we have, the more deterministic the answer will be. The, the fewer neurons we have in the previous layer, the more fluctuations there will be. Right. So in right. the end, yeah, it doesn't matter if, we're, if we have one or two output neurons, that's all right, it's only when the neurons that we add up, these are the neurons from the hidden layers. So you, you might have to decrease by hand, so to speak, the fluctuations and the Later, yeah. later. Yeah, I guess there are tricks to do that. I was just saying in this minimal setup, naively reducing the number of neurons probably will not work. It might be like ADS, you know, you have some work. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in a sense, like uh, exactly as you said, in the end, it could be just a few neurons that are useful, but we really need uh, a lot more neurons to make these few neurons useful. <laughs> that's my intuition. I can't make it more precise, but uh, yeah, that's my intuition. Yeah, I was just trying to think about, you know, like I said, if you if you really want to think about this as an RG, that would be kind of like coarse graining, right? You're mm -hmm. trying to propagate the information forward, but with fewer and fewer, you're 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 losing information as you go, right? That's yeah. It's in an, in the spirit of the RG. Yeah. But so maybe, maybe one. Consistent. I don't know. Right. Maybe one question um, that is worth asking is could we define certain measures of I don't know how to call it scale or <laughs> um, certain measures of uh, information loss or scale or RG scale um, that we can track uh, the evolution of across the layers so that will map onto the notion of course training that could be possible um, yeah Yeah, so for right now, you're just trying to make sure that within a layer deep in the neural network, the different uh, uh, nodes in that layer are correlated with each other. So right now, for now, that's what you've been calculating, right? Right, yeah. You want to say that what you don't want is that they are somehow chaotically correlated. That right, they, yeah. You, but on the other hand, you don't want them to be independent random variables. Somehow right. those, yeah. those extremes is bad for information processing. But yeah. you haven't explored really the dimension of optimally propagating information through the neural network. Right, yeah. Okay. Hmm. The people who actually Actually, I have a very stupid question. Does does do these things have anything to do with like chat GPT? Are those in any sense neural networks or is that a completely different type of strut learning structure? I mean, those, those are neural networks. It's just a, a, a more complicated structure than what I'm showing here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Huh. So in some sense, you're you used to be in the you know middle of the uh, uh, 20th century. Physicists were working on bombs to destroy the world, but now you're working on different ways of destroying the world. Uh, I don't know. I <laughs> yeah, artificial I wanna, intelligence. Yeah, yeah. We won't destroy the world by trying to understand more about field theories. So uh, no. I'm happy with it. <laughs> Well, this is really cool. Yeah, thanks. So are you guys continuing with this? What's the, what are your, are you still thinking about this? Are there any next steps you're thinking about? Yeah, so maybe uh, we should are... stop the recording. Oh, yeah, sure. Stop the recording. We should have stopped that a while ago. Yeah, so, so 